The Six Million Dollar Man. Who saw it? Anybody see that? Yeah. Used to love that show. I tell you what, all you younger folks, before there was the Terminator, there was Steve Austin. And he was a good guy. Yeah. And uh, I remember playing out uh, outside my house, just all the time. I was Steve Austin every day. I mean, I think I had his lunchbox, you know, I just, I just wanted to be the bionic man. And I would make the noise every time I'd run. You know, I'd always go into slow-mo, and you'd be like, ah, did, 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 right? That was so much fun. If you, if you didn't see it, you missed it. I'm sorry. It's a part of your life you'll never have. But uh, <clears throat> it was just a joy. Growing up, and I, the reason, okay, so you're asking yourselves, Luke 6, Steve Austin? Well, I don't get it. Let me explain. Steve Austin was a broken man. You saw him land that plane, land that plane. Uh, he was a guy who was, uh, for all you know, intents and purposes, dead. And uh, these scientists or whatever on the show, they, they put him back together and they made him better, stronger, faster. Here's a correlation. You and I, spiritually speaking, uh, Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that we, indeed, were dead. And that spiritually speaking, God, through the grace that uh, came to us on the cross through Jesus Christ, has given us life again. But he doesn't want to just stop there. He doesn't want to just give us a get, a hell, get out of hell free pass and have us wait for some kind of rapture or the end of the world to come so that we can go spend eternity with him. No. His hope, once we have put our faith in Jesus, is to make us better, stronger in our faith, faster to act like his son, Jesus Christ. And so I was thinking about this text that we're going to study today in the Six Million Dollar Man. I was like, hey, God's in the business of making Six Million Dollar Christians. <laughs> in the Six Million Dollar Man, they fixed uh, Steve Austin's eyes, his arm, and his legs. In the text that we're going to study today, Jesus is going to address the Christian's eyes, the Christian's heart, and the Christian's feet. And he's going to talk to us as he talked to his uh, crowd and uh, his followers back in that day. He's going to tell us about the importance of moving in this direction with those parts of us uh, to honor him and to be more like him. And so I'm going to talk to you about that when we're done. We're going to learn here uh, what it's going to take for us to build uh, a better Christian. And then when I mean that, I mean us. And so let me pray, and we'll get to that this morning. God, thanks for your word, and thanks that it has the power to change those who hear it. And so I'm going to pray that right off the bat. I pray that in this room we have a, a room full of hearers, people who understand your word, uh, un understand it clearly. Uh, and then, God, I'm going to pray that you're going to make them doers of your word. Uh, we know it's not just enough to know these things, it's not just enough to agree intellectually with the truth of your scripture. We need to live out the things that you teach in this book. So help us do that. As always, God, I ask that you push me aside, and in my place you would speak so that we hear your voice, that we, uh, we understand your leading, and that we would... Uh, respond to what you have for us this morning. I pray this in the matchless name of your son, Jesus Christ, who made this all possible. We celebrate him. We magnify him. And we give him the glory he deserves. And it's in his name that I pray. And everybody said? If you got a Bible, Ma or Matthew, sure, let's go there. Why not? Okay, Luke, then, chapter 6. Four things that we're going to talk about this morning about how we can build a better Christ follower. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to give this Christ follower eyes that see. You're going to talk about truth right off the bat. Jesus has gone in the first part of his sermon. He talked about the contented life, how to live a blessed life. We talked about that the first week. Last week we talked about his kind of love. It's crazy love. It supersedes the world's standard of love. And we, we discovered that we're supposed to love our enemies last week. Now Jesus is going to give us a couple warnings and a couple words of instruction, and he's going to make us better, stronger, and faster to be like him followers. He's going to start with our eyes. Give them eyes that see so they can know the truth. It says this in verse 39. He also told them this parable, shortest parable in all the New Testament. Here it comes. It's one sentence long. It says this. Can a blind man lead a blind man? It's a rhetorical question. Survey says no. In fact, it's, it's uh, highly unfavorable for blind people 
to follow blind people. I was going to have some fun with us this morning, have a couple of you men come up here. I was going to actually blindfold you and just let you walk around this stage up here. But then I thought about insurance premiums and things like that and thought against it. But if we all saw that spectacle, we would all agree that our tensions would rise. We would not be excited for these men as they neared the edge of the state. I mean, it's a dangerous thing to be a blind person in life, but it's an equally or, or even more dangerous thing for that person to be following someone else who can't see as well. Now, we've all experienced this in life. Every one of us has that friend who is sure of where he's going but really isn't. And so he gets in his car, we get in our car, and we spend about an hour and a half on a perfectly good Saturday following this guy around to nowhere. Does anybody have this friend? Because he didn't, you know, he just remembers it from when he was a kid. I know how to get there. Anybody know this guy? Are you sitting next to this guy? Yeah. It happens all the time in life where we're following people who don't know where they're going. I was in a golf tournament just a few weeks ago, and uh, it was a shotgun tournament. That means all the golfers start at the same time, so roughly at the same time, all the, golfer, all, all the golfers finish. <laughs> and so uh, I was heading back to the clubhouse with my, my group, and I, saw, I thought I remembered that you could, you could get to the clubhouse by going this way. So I turned this way. Well, I didn't know that the entire back nine of golfing groups was following us back to what they thought was the golf, you know, clubhouse. But I turned and went the exact opposite way. I took us all, I mean, it's one of these golf courses where 18 or 16 of the 18 holes are all in a nice straight line all the way down here, and the clubhouse was right there. I went this way. And so we drove, golf carts go really slow. Have you ever noticed this? We drove for what seemed like days this direction and uh, got to the end of the road, and of course, it just looped around the last hole. So I got to be the front car, looping around and seeing every other golf cart that had followed me. Hey, everyone. Hey, yes, I'm, I'm the moron. How you doing? Yeah. Yeah, people, uh, people are going in directions that they have no clue uh, as to where they're going to end up. And uh, we oftentimes get duped into following them. See uh, Madoff, the Ponzi scheme. You, you with me? Jesus says here, don't, don't be a blind person. Don't be a young follower. In essence, he's describing to this crowd back then how they should be living in their new following of Jesus Christ. He says, listen, I'm teaching you a new way. Don't be a new follower, a, a young follower who doesn't know where to go yet, a blind person in essence, following these other blind people that are going to lead you away from the truth that I'm teaching. He was referring to the religious leaders of the time. If you read the Gospels, any of them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, you're going to see Jesus taking to task these guys called the Pharisees. They're the ones who actually, uh, in the end, end up trumping up charges to kill Jesus and are the ones who uh, you know, brought that whole fate into Jesus' life. Uh, they were enemies of sorts, and uh, these Pharisees were uh, against Jesus because Jesus was teaching truth and the Pharisees were purporting a lie. The Pharisees had been teaching everybody up to that point that the way that they could be reconciled to God was to obey uh, and keep all of the laws. They, they were the champions of keeping the rules. But the Bible has never taught once that we are saved by keeping the rules. In fact, the rules were only given to us, this is what it teaches us in Romans, as a standard by which we would measure ourselves against, and all of us would find ourselves not measuring up. That's what the rules are for. They weren't meant to be the hoops that we jump through so that God will love us. Well, that's what the Pharisees were teaching. They were teaching that because everybody likes to have the rules uh, in life that slant everything to their favor. Has anybody ever played a board game at someone's house and they play it completely different from how you play it? Okay, It's because they play it in a way that it slants it towards them and, and puts it in their favor to win the game. Has anybody ever played a game with someone and they make up the rules as they go along? That's a fun day, isn't it? What do you mean you have to run backwards around the bases? That's how we play at my house. You're out. 